an overview of our worship service today includes a prelude, a hymn of invocation, the hymn of the day, the reading of scripture, a sermon, and a pro processional hymn. Welcome to Liberating Hope's traditional online worship service. We will be celebrating Holy Communion during the service today. Please arrange to have bread and juice nearby if you would like to participate in this part of the worship service. Enjoy today's prelude as we prepare our hearts for worship. Please join in the singing of today's Hymn of Invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, has given His only Son to die for us, and for His sake forgives us all our sins. To whoever believes in Jesus Christ, He gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Greet one another with the peace of the Lord. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, you know we live in the midst of so many dangers that in our frailty we cannot stand upright. Grant strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from the New International Version of the Bible, 
as read by Max McLean. Matthew chapter 13 That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced the crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, First collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, 
Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join in the singing of the hymn of the day.
Good morning. Our sermon today is based on uh, the 13th chapter of Matthew, or at least most of it, verses 1 through 52. And the title is The Importance of Perceiving Jesus, Where's Waldo? Watershed Message. It's basically on the parables of Jesus in, in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day uh, that you've given us in this time of worship, Lord, where we can just be with you, Lord, in this way. And just give you praise and glory, Lord, for who you are, what you've done. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which we are uh, diving into right now, Lord, uh, to learn, to understand, to hear, Lord, uh, to be impacted uh, by it, Lord, so that we uh, will leave our time of worship today, Lord, impacted by our encounter with you. We call on your Holy Spirit, Lord, uh, to open our hearts and open our minds uh, so that um, we will have the greatest understanding possible, Lord, that goes beyond just our own uh, reason and our own rational understanding, that your Spirit will open up the full text to us, Lord, so that we hear and understand your word. We thank you, Lord, for the day in front of us. We thank you for this time together. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with Where's Waldo, but um, when my kids were younger, we had a lot of Where's Waldo books. And um, with Where's Waldo, you... Um, there's a picture of Waldo, and he's he's in he's interspersed with a crowd. You can see this crowd on the beach here, and you he's there, but you've got to find him, and you have to work to find him. It takes it takes a lot of perception, and a lot of scanning, and a lot of work to find where Waldo is in the in this crowd. And that's what parables are like. Parables, the message is not just right there on the surface. You have to work at getting to the message that's there. It takes some effort on your part to perceive what, what uh, Jesus is getting at. And parables, the parables of Jesus are like a watershed. You can see a watershed here. There's a divide in the in the topography of the land and at the watershed water will run in different directions it will cause a divide and water will run on one side or one run one way and on another side it will run another way and the parables of jesus were like a watershed for those that could perceive and had spiritual ears and uh, were open and uh, could hear his message uh, versus those who were hard of hearing. And actually, the parables made them even harder to hear. And and so the, the parables created a division, and, and we will be talking about that as we go. A parable is a, ver is a way of communicating. It's a way of communicating truth, through a narrative analogy uh, in bringing out a moral or spiritual um, argument or, or point. And there's some different types of parables, as we can see here. A proverb, a simile, a similitude, a story, an allegory. I'm not going to go into the definitions of all of these. Um, but it's, it's usually an earthly story with a heavenly message or meaning. And so the earthly story means it's real practical. It's down to earth. It's, it relates to a story about something that people can really identify with. And it both hides and communicates truth. And that's the watershed we we're talking about. 
And in, in the interpretation, which we will be doing uh, as part of the sermon today, it usually involves a central point along with subpoints. And the audience for Jesus, uh, as we've been talking about, involves religious leaders who outright deny and oppose Jesus. We have disciples who are obedient to the Father's will. And then we have the crowd. And the question is, will they obey the Father's will and become disciples? Or will they follow the lead of the religious leaders and reject Jesus? And these parables will test the crowd's responsiveness to Jesus, while at the same time instruct disciples about the kingdom of heaven. And so we, with, with this chapter, which we've previously read, we're getting into what's called the parabolic discourse of Jesus. We, we started earlier with the Sermon on the Mount, which is the first discourse or the teaching of Jesus. Then we had the um, mission discourse where he uh, taught them before sending them out on their mission. Now we have the parabolic discourse and there's five discourses so there's two more that will be uh, will be coming. Uh, one is on uh, life in the church, uh, fellowship and, and uh, functioning in the church, relationships in the church, and then there's a discourse on the end times. It's called eschatology or eschatological discourse, and that will be coming. And our central idea uh, from this text, the main point is that Jesus teaches those with varying in spiritual perception with parables about the kingdom. So we have those groups I just talked about, the spiritual leaders, uh, those in the crowds that are not made up their minds about Jesus, and then the disciples that have various degrees of pure spiritual perception. Jesus teaches them with parables about the kingdom. So we ask, what parables about the kingdom did Jesus teach those with that, that varied in spiritual perception? And Jesus teaches those with varying in pure spiritual perception with parables about the kingdom's growth and the kingdom's value. Those are the two main areas that Jesus teaches uh, uh, these different groups that varied in their spiritual perception about the kingdom's growth and about the kingdom's value. Now, uh, there's seven or eight uh, parables. I, I'd say there's eight, and I'll show you as we go through. And the first four are directed to the crowds, whereas the last four are directed specifically to the disciples, because the first four are when they are outside of the house. And the last four, it says they go indoors, and so that would be with Jesus, most likely 12 disciples. And three of the uh, parables in each uh, grouping of four, Jesus starts by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like, and then he goes on and gives what it is like in, in a parable way, and making an analogy. So first of all, Jesus teaches those varying in spiritual perception with parables about the kingdom's growth. And the first one has to do with transformational growth. And it's a common, it's a well-known parable uh, about the, the sower and the seeds and the soils. Let's go through it. That same day, Jesus went out of the house. So now he's outside the house. He sits by the lake and a large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. 
but when the sun came up the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked plants still other seed fell on good soil where it produced the crop a hundred sixty or thirty times what was sown whoever has ears let them hear okay so this is the parable of the sower and sometimes it's referred to a par as a parable about parables because it's a parable about the sower but then there, within it there's like four parables there's seed that falls on a path there's seed that falls on um, <clears throat> rocky soil there's seed that falls on thorny soil <clears throat> and then there's seed that falls on good soil and each of them is representing something and although there's a question that comes up after this that we'll get to in a moment and then it's followed by jesus interpreting it so we'll jump from uh, verse 9 to verse 18 where jesus interprets it and he says listen then to what the parable of the sower means when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke out the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So on the good soil, we get in, in the person um, what is sown uh, changes the person and there's growth and that's the transformational growth so in this the son of man is the one that sows the good seed and that's the gospel of the kingdom and we have these different responses on the path we have hard hearts on the rocky uh, soil we have shallow hearts on the thorny soil we have thorny hearts uh, where the word is choked out and on the good soil we have receptive hearts and the hard hearts on the on the uh, on the path where the seed is sown, we have outright rejection. And these are like the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, who are against Jesus from the start, and they're real vulnerable to Satan, uh, who snatches uh, the word away right away. Um, the shallow hearts, where the seed is fall, falls on the rocky soil, where the soil is thin. There's a shallow reception of the word. Uh, it's a superficial reception of the gospel and life's trials, hardships, um, keeps the word and the gospel from taking hold. And these are like those who have in the crowd who have not made a commitment uh, to the kingdom or to Jesus. The thorny soil, uh, the gospel gets competition from the world. There's competing priorities that prevents the transformation of the heart. Um, it talks about the deceptive pleasures of worries and wealth that competes. And so the, the, the seed never grows. There's no transformation. And then finally, the good soil, the receptive hearts, it's deeply received and it would be what we call the fruit of the spirit develops the person hears they understand it allow and then it is allowed to take full root and it produces the fr fruit which is righteousness good works and the harvest uh, and the abundance the hundred the sixty the thirty times it, it they they work for the kingdom and they produce new converts. Let's look at some of, some of these other verses and what they say uh, that uh, reinforces what's said in this uh, parable. 
James 1 11 says, For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. So again, it's making an analogy between the rich whose, whose wealth is choking out the word and the sun rising and scorching the ground and, and withering the plants. And, and so they fade away and the word is fading away from them. Uh, Genesis 26, 12 is talking about Isaac planting crops in the land and that same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. So the, the blessing from the Lord brings about the, the fruitfulness. 1 John 3, 9, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. So here it's talking about the seed being planted and the righteousness that comes into that person's life as they as they become transformed um, and become more and more Christ-like. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And the fruit of the spirit is really what Jesus is like and what he talks about in the Sermon of the Mount and what he says what life in the kingdom is like and what his disciples are like if they follow him and Colossians 1 10 so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way bearing fruit in every good work growing in the knowledge of God and that is what happens if um, the word is deeply received it's heard it's understood and and it's allowed to take root in the person's life and that's that's the parable of the sower resulting in transformational growth jesus says at the end whoever has ears let them hear and he's talking about spiritual ears um, the parable is for those with the ability to hear the spiritual message that's embedded and that's one side of the watershed. So after he says the parable and before he interprets it, the text goes on this way. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And so I'm calling this decisive growth because the decision is, needing to, is needed to be made here. And this is the watershed that I initially talked about and showed in an illustration there with the mountain and the water going to one side or the other. And <clears throat> Jesus is saying that um, uh, whoever has will be given more and they'll have abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And then quotes uh, Isaiah about they they have eyes but cannot see and ears but cannot hear and it's talking about the hard-heartedness and the spiritual blindedness and um, I think the best way I can understand that is <clears throat> when I was in my uh, psychiatric training we had psychotherapy supervisors and there was one supervisor I had um, <clears throat> whenever I'd ask him questions he would always reply with a story. 
He would never answer my questions directly. He always replied with a story. And um, a lot of times when I was meeting with him, I was tired and I didn't really want to think, you know, I would have rather he just gave me an answer. And then, you know, so I, I got the answer. But his stories were always a challenge to me. And it made me think, it made me ponder, it made me have to work and, and kind of understand it on, on a much deeper level. Um, when I asked the question, he didn't just spoon feed me, um, which if he had, it probably would have just gone in and right out the other ear. And, and so his stories challenged me to do work, to get at the meaning of something. And in this situation, those that were disciples, they were willing to do the work. They wanted to do the work. They wanted to understand. And so they worked at getting at the meaning. And when they struggled, they asked Jesus uh, to help explain it. Those that outright rejected Jesus, they, they, didn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't want to do any work to understand him. They were rejecting him already. So why would they want to do any work to try to understand his parables that involve some work with them? And those that were on the fence, again, some of them may have wanted to do some work and some of them might not have. Um, and it helped kind of determine that. And those that were pushing him away, when they would push his parables away, they just kind of pushed themselves further away from them. And so when he says, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them, they were just making themselves even harder of hearing uh, when, they, when they would not do the work that was required with the parables in order to uh, get at the meaning or to understand. Um, and certainly it was only the disciples we have that ever asked the questions, you know, to try to get at the meaning that they didn't understand. So that's the best way I can explain that. Um, the quote from Isaiah uh, in the Septuagint, uh, which is um, a translation of the Old Testament uh, into um, Latin, um, I believe, and um, set with 70 scholars, that's where the Septuagint the step two part comes from. Uh, it says, ye shall hear indeed, but ye shall not understand, and ye shall see indeed, but ye shall not perceive. For the heart of this people has uh, become gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. So parables were being used by Jesus to cause the crowd to make a decision about the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus talked about the secrets of the kingdom of heaven that were being revealed to the disciples. Secrets um, is a word that in Greek was mysteria or, or our word mystery. And that has to do with end times secrets that are passed on to God's people in kind of veiled speech, which we're talking about here. In Daniel 2, 18 to 19, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. Uh, dreams are veiled messages as well, and none of his wise men uh, could interpret it for him, and so he ended up killing his wise men. And Daniel uh, was called to interpret it. Um, and in Daniel 2, 18 and 19, it reads, he urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. I believe it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Daniel's friends. And during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. And so the mystery of the of the Nebuchadnezzar's dream was revealed to Daniel, and he was then able to 
um, articulate it to Nebuchadnezzar, interpret the dream, uh, because the mystery had been revealed to him. Um, Jesus says, though seen, they do not see. Um, and so the parable's blinding force is due to their hard-heartedness. Um, so in the crowd, we have those that are following Jesus, leaning towards following Jesus, those opposing him, and those that are sitting on the fence, and the parables force the issue to them to force them to make a decision, as they do with, with us. You have people that may be listening right now that are leaning towards following Jesus, some that are, are opposed to following Jesus, and some who are on the fence with Jesus, and these parables force the issue to make a decision. Um, Isaiah 6, 9 through 10, which Jesus quoted, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding, be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people callous, make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Talking about um, Israel in, in years past, um, with respect to um, their their perception of the Messiah. And so God does not force anyone to accept the kingdom. Uh, and so acceptance is due to the condition of one's heart. So Going on in the text, it says, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. So <clears throat> there's the unhearing crowd who are like the spiritually blind and the ignorant of Isaiah's day, and the disciples who are like the prophets and the righteous people in the Old Testament, who, who, who had faith and, and who could hear and see and who believed in the coming Messiah. And now the disciples are actually seen in living color what they didn't get to see, but yet believed would happen. And so ultimately the parables are a spiritual examination of openness to Jesus' message of the kingdom and how open someone is. And on the other hand, for the disciples and those who are responsive, they provide instruction. So, if we go on here, um, and so we, we're, we're halfway through this chapter, and it's really just been taken up by the uh, parable of the sower and Jesus' explanation about why he's talking in parables. And then we go on with another big uh, parable that's also about sowing. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring them to my barn. And so this, this um, parable is when Jesus is teaching about growth again, about the kingdom's growth for those that have variations in their spiritual perception from hardness of heart to openness. And this is about protective growth because you have wheat growing up together with weeds. And again, later on, uh, there's an interpretation of this, which is on the right-hand side. 
And let's read through that. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. And this is again where he's leaving the crowd and he's going to be just with the disciples. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are the angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So what, what is being talked about in this parable is that there's a mixed nature in the world. That the wheat represents the good and the righteous. The evil in the world are, are from Satan, not from God. And at the end of times, the evil are eliminated. But prior to that, there is what we call spiritual warfare. And as we can see in the Gospel of John, in Jesus' prayer in chapter 17, the Father protects um, he protects the wheat, or he protects his own um, from the evil. And Jesus' prayer goes as follows. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As, I, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For, for them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. And then Paul in Ephesians 4.27 addresses issues related to this as well, when he says, and do not give the devil a foothold. Because we live in a world that's mixed. Um, uh, there is this spiritual warfare going on. And at the end of times, the, the parable talks about an eventual rescue as the angels come to do the harvesting. Now, there's a secondary application of this that has to do with the church, too, because there can be wheat and weeds within the church, too. So if we go on, then uh, in verse 31, it says, He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. And so these two parables are similar in that they Jesus is talking uh, to those with varying spiritual perception about the kingdom's hidden growth through these two. There's a contrast here um, being made about the the partial inauguration of the kingdom, which is hidden and inconspicuous now, and the final consummation of the kingdom with its greatness and glory that ultimately comes. And, um, and so you have this small seed that grows into this huge plant and you have yeast, which works its way into the dough, which makes the dough greatly expand ultimately. And the the issue about the popularity of the church, um, that's hidden except to those with eyes of faith. And it's not a final gauge of the kingdom's influence. You know, because it's the kingdom is growing inconspicuously. That's what these two um, parables are getting at. 
In verse 34, Jesus again is getting at the issue of why he's speaking in parables. He says, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter, utter things hidden since the creation of the world, which comes from Psalm 78 2, which reads, I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter things, hidden things, things from of old. And so the kingdom is growing in a prophetic way. It was prophesied. Um, and and he's 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 taught he's uh, speaking only in parables and he's talking about how the kingdom grows uh, through these parables um, for the purposes that we've we've already spoken about <clears throat> so now we're in the house and these are being these parables are being directed just to the disciples the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field when a man found it he hid it again and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. So now we're getting into not the growth of the kingdom, but the value of the kingdom. Jesus is teaching the disciples who have spiritual perception, have spiritual ears, about the value of the kingdom and that it, it's incalculable it's a great value and he's doing it through these two parables so the kingdom has a value that's far beyond what anyone looking at it could see that's the the treasure in the field there was a treasure hidden in the field no one could see the value of the field but when when the treasure was found in the field then it was known to be a great value but the value was far beyond what anyone could see. And with the fine pearls, nothing is of comparison to the worth of the kingdom. No sacrifice is too great. That's why this, in the parable, the man goes out and sells everything in order to purchase the fine pearls. No cost is too much in comparison to the benefits of the kingdom, which are salvation and righteousness. Now, that can, the benefits uh, the, can be taken for granted by those who have had them since they were young, and also by those who work and get their living in the church, where it may become kind of routine for them. Um, and so, these things can be taken for granted. These, these things of great value might become kind of almost too, too routine for some people if they came to faith real early in life and it's always been there for them since early childhood or for those that are <clears throat> professionals in the church. They have to guard against it. Philippians 3, 7 through 8 says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. This is Paul saying the same thing about the, the incalculable worth of the kingdom and, and uh, having Christ as his savior. Going on, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. They sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come, separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is just like the <clears throat> weeds and the wheat, where the, the world is mixed. And, and this, this parable, which is given just to the disciples in the house, is, is the same type of, same type of theme. Uh, the mixed nature 
the spiritual warfare, the Father's protective hand, the eventual rescue, and that um, the separation at the end time will will make will will maintain the pure value or the holiness of the kingdom of God. At the very end, Jesus, after these parables, Jesus asked the disciples, have you understood all these things? And they reply, yes. And then he ends by saying to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. And so this is where it's debatable whether this is a eighth parable in this chapter, because it talks about <clears throat> the teachers of the law who, who become disciples in the kingdom of heaven are like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures. So there is a, an analogy being made. And so some people consider this another parable. And I would myself. Um, who's the teacher of the law? Well, he says the teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom. So these are Jesus' disciples. And what is their storeroom? Well, the storeroom has to do with their heart, their being as a person, their heart, and the new treasures. Um, it's not the new things of Christ being added to the old, but it's a renewal of the old uh, that Jesus has brought and, and his re renewal of the old. Um, and the disciples say, yes, they understand these things. Um, the, these, these things are not for, for personal reasons, but they're for uh, in their capacity as a teacher for the good of others which comes into the producing fruit in the, in the kingdom. Um, the owner of the house brings out of his storeroom these new treasures that are um, uh, the renewal of the old in, in Jesus for the, for, the, for the benefit of others, um, the teaching of others. As Christ has taught them, as Jesus has taught them, they will teach others with these treasures about the kingdom of heaven and produce fruit. And, and, and the, the treasures are the true value. So we have the incalculable value and we have the true value. So Jesus teaches those varying in spiritual perception with parables about the kingdom's growth and about their value. And the first four parables were uh, were directed at the crowd although the disciples were with the crowd whereas the last four parables were directed to the disciples they were inside the house the crowd was not with them and we talked about the growth that was transformational having to do with the different types of soils with the good soil being the one that transforms the heart um about uh why Jesus spoke in parables um, and, and how it forced the issue. And, and, and may, so it was kind of a decisiveness of the parables. It was a watershed type of uh, issue. Uh, we talked about the parable of the weeds and, and the protective growth that there was. Uh, Jesus' prayer from John that, that the Father would watch over them while they were in the world. And then we talked about the hidden nature of the growth with this, this parable of the mustard seed and the yeast. With the value, we talked about the incalculable value with the treasure in the field and the, and the fine pearls. Uh, we talked about the, the net with the fish and the separation at the end of times that, that kept the pureness or the holiness of the kingdom. And then the true value uh, because of the, the, the storehouse of treasures and the teachings, the true teachings uh, that the disciples would, would pass on about the kingdom as they had received from Jesus.
So Jesus' challenge to us through these parables is his challenge to the crowds and the disciples 2,000 years ago. In rejecting him, our inability to perceive what he is telling us gets worse and worse until we are totally unable to see or hear anything he's saying. If we're ambivalent and sit on the fence about him, there's still a chance we may be able to perceive his voice in his teaching, but it's just as likely of a chance that we won't as well as time goes by. Whereas with acceptance of Jesus, our perception of his message opens the door to our heart, which becomes transformed so that it's filled with a storehouse of treasures, the fruit of the Spirit, that allows us to shine the light of his kingdom, which Jesus described in the Sermon on the Mount. And we're able to shine that in this world. Father, thank you for these parables that challenge us to think, that make us ponder your meaning for our lives and open our heart and mind so that we can spiritually hear your voice and by understanding who you are and what you have done through your son, Jesus Christ, that our heart will be transformed so that we're able to love others with the love you've given to us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let's confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the, for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us join together in the prayer of the church. Almighty God, giver of all things, with gladness we give thanks for all your goodness. We bless you for the love that has created and that sustains us. We praise you for the gift of your Son, through whom you have made known your will and grace. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the lives of all faithful and loving people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that our Lord has done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness in worship and praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Save and defend your church around the world, purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Give it pastors and ministers filled with your spirit. Make it perfect in love and in all good works and establish it in the faith delivered to the saints. Sanctify and unite your people in all the world so that one holy church may bear witness to you. In your mercy, strengthen and support the faithful in times of trial. Send the light of your truth into all the earth. Raise up faithful servants of Christ to labor in the gospel both at home and in distant lands. 
bless and encourage those who are obeying the command to make disciples in all nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide and bless liberating hope as we endeavor as a community to do your will and to be a faithful example of God's truth and Christ's love through the power of the Holy Spirit. Grant your wisdom and grace to all pastors, ministers, staff members, leaders, volunteers, and members, so that by our faithful service, faith may abound and your kingdom increase. Continue to provide for our congregation and direct us in the future to seek your will and follow your ways as a community called to love and to serve both you and all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve our nation in justice and honor, that each person may lead a peaceful life of integrity and dignity. Grant wisdom and guidance to all who bear office in our land, especially to the president, the governor, and all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Help them to serve the, this people according to your holy will. Take from our people all hatred and prejudice. Give us the spirit of love and direct our ways in your peace. Guide those who take counsel for the nations of the world, that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among all peoples. Bestow your wisdom in such measure that people may serve you in church and state and that our common life may be conformed to the rule of your truth and justice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all schools, colleges, universities, and places of learning and those who teach, serve, and learn in them. Protect our children, students, educators, and administrators so that all people can learn and grow in environments of wonder and joy, not fear and anger. Sanctify our homes and families with your presence and peace. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to raise them in a life of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in love and affection that they may be instruments of grace in our land and in all our world. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Let your blessing rest upon the seed time and harvest, the commerce and industry, the leisure and rest, the arts and cultures of our people. Take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Protect and guide those serving to guard our freedom and to ensure our peace and safety. Be with all who lay their hands to any useful task. Give them just rewards for their labor and the knowledge that their work is good in your sight. Provide for those in need of meaningful work and sufficient pay so that their daily needs will be met and they will find purpose and satisfaction in their labor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort with the grace of your Holy Spirit all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow or mourning. To all grant a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. We also remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you on earth, who now rest from their labors. Keep us in fellowship with all your saints and bring us at last to the joy of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of your Son, who died and rose again for our sakes, and now lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. In deciding what to give to the local church and organizations in need, let our attitude reflect that of Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver.
Let us prepare for the celebration of Holy Communion. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on your children and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts that he may establish in us a living faith and prepare us joyfully to remember our Redeemer and receive him who comes to us in his body and blood. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. my body we 
which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The bread you receive is the body of Christ given for you. The juice you receive is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting. Go in peace. Amen.
Let us pray. Send us forth, O Lord, into the world. Refreshed by your love, redeemed by your glory, and renewed by your forgiveness, that we may show forth your glory in all that we say or do, and that others may see you in us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Fellow Christians, we now leave this time of worship, fed and strengthened by God's word, to fulfill our mission in our community and world. Our mission to love and obey the Savior, equip believers for ministry, and share the good news of Jesus. Please join in the singing of the recessional hymn for today.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Take time to rest today. Pray for peace and healing in our cities across the nation. Pray for worldwide coronavirus recovery. Have a safe week ahead and be kind to others.